everyone, welcome to another Chew Chat. I am Justine Dorn, and, and this is my fiance. <laughs> around Rayfield. That's right. <laughs> and what do we have here today? We have meat upon meat. We got a lot of meat here. It's all pork face. Now this is actually a dish from 1823 <laughs> from the cookbook called American Domestic Cookery. However, the sauce I got from another cookbook that was published in 1808, A New System of Domestic Cookery because the American cookery book did not have the recipe for the sauce. It just said, use a curry sauce, but there was no recipe for the curry sauce in that whole book. So I had to go back to a previous recipe that we made that was really good that had curry in it. I liked it and I love mm -hmm. curry. So when she told me we were doing this, I was super excited. <laughs> That's actually Ron's favorite food is curry. <laughs> I am a curry nut. I put it yeah. on everything, curry tacos, curry scrambled eggs, curry pizza, Chili. Don't give up all it. our secrets. Okay. It's the, but it's the secret ingredient in a lot of our stuff. And even in this time period, people were obsessed with curry spices in America and in Britain. So, shall whoa, 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 whoa. we... Before we go any farther, if you want to see this being made, <laughs> go please over. go over to our main channel, Early American, to watch Justine make this lovely, delicious meal and other it's... meals in the past. Over there, we cook it. And here we eat it, That's and right. we're going to review it for you all and That's see, right. is this really good? <laughs> well, let me serve you up. Okay, thank you. It looks like mashed potatoes on the outside, but it's actually rice. Rice mixed with egg yolk. So that's why it's turned slightly yellowish, and it looks like mashed taters. Want some more? Oh, yeah, I'll take that last spoonful. I Thank wish y'all could smell this. It smells oh, delicious. It smells amazing. Let's have a look at this before I eat the rest of it. Demolish look at that. it. Look how it's really hot, but look how good that is. Yeah. Or the pretty side. You can see the, the bacon on the back. It's hot. Now, I've already tried this, so I know this is really good. And I have not tried it yet. Mm. I've only smelt it and synced it. <laughs> Ron and I are the same when it comes to curry. We're both obsessed with curry. So I guess we would have fit right in 200 years ago too. Now, for some of the people who don't know, how would they have gotten curry here in America back then? Same way we do today, right? It's, all imported. the spices are imported. And a lot of things are being imported up the Mississippi mm -hmm. River because mm -hmm. a lot of people say, oh, well, they didn't have that back then. They oh, sure yeah, did. Oh yeah, they did. <laughs> and they were crazy about it. There's Chinese export porcelain that was found in St. Genevieve in uh, mm -hmm. the Bull Duke house, which is an 18th century house. So they definitely had a very well established trade route in this time period, in our time period. And the Chinese export porcelain was from the 18th century. So that means it's been around, the, these trade routes have been around for a really long time, even before the 1820s. And we got water, help that meat go down. <laughs> It's your Thank turn you. to say the blessing today. We'll do. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we're going to dive into this. Let's say grace. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for the company that we have today, and thank you for the food. May it nourish our bodies. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> if you like curry, you're going to like Here this. Here I go. <laughs> mm. That's really good. That's really good. <coughs> it's strong. <laughs> well, I like it strong. Well, that's good. <laughs> because it says cayenne pepper. Has the cayenne created. pepper is getting me. I don't think it's that strong. It just went down the wrong pipe of yours. Mmm. That is really good. Mm. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Oh, oh my gosh. It's going to be hard to talk in this one. Great job. So. One out of ten, what would you give this 200 year old dish? Well, I'm only three bites in, but mm -hmm. getting ten. If you like meat and if you like curry, this is a ten. This is really good. This is like a ten dollar plate at a restaurant. This mm -hmm. is this is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think anybody mm -hmm. today would, would like this and they wouldn't think, oh, this is a historical dish or mm -hmm. They just think it's a really good comfort food. This is comfort food. Mm -hmm. And it is currently snowing outside. Yep. And so this is perfect. We have the fire going. Yes. Warm food in our bellies. Mm -hmm. 
Now we look at it before we cut it up, and yeah, it does look a little strange by modern palettes. Nowadays, we're not really into decorating food in such a way like they did 200 years ago. Especially not just meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but once you eat it, and once it's all mixed up on your plate, it's really, really good. And you could fool someone into thinking this is a modern dish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alright, I'm just going to come out and say it. This is probably the best thing I've ate on the show. Are you kidding me? I'm dead serious. And there's been a lot of really good things, but this is hmm. the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you're making me think what is the best historic dish we've made. I told you we should have made two of these. You're going to eat all this? If you're not going to eat that, I'm going to eat that. Okay. Well, I'm glad. It's not going to go so away. Good. He's shoveling it in. <laughs> I need a bigger fork. Uh, That's one thing I hate about. Here's a serving spoon. <laughs> That's too big. Let's yeah. not be silly now. <laughs> oh, just trying to help. <laughs> For me, I think the best thing I've made on this show, it's a tie between the Queen's Cakes that were from the 18th century, the late 18th century, and the chicken curry that I used this mm. same recipe on. That was really good. Originally, too. last year. That I could make at least once a week in my life. I could eat that mm -hmm. once a week in my life. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this is this is good too. Uh, I mean, I'd put that one second then. And then number three would be the uh, meat venison pie from Christmas last okay. year. Mm -hmm. hey, speaking of Christmas, we hope you all had a great Christmas. Oh, yeah. We, you know, Christmas was mm -hmm. just a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And really, it's still Christmas by uh, our time period standards you get the 12 days of Christmas. Yeah, the 12 days of Christmas. So when does that actually end? That ends on January 6th. But this is the last day we're going to keep our Christmas tree. Yes, and that's time you guys mm -hmm. to see us to be a day or two after New Year's. Yep. We decided to share Christmas with our chickens. We're going to give the apples and the cookies on our tree to the chickies. And for those of you who have asked if each week how the apples are doing, the apples are doing fine. As you can see, they still got their good color. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they last about three weeks. They're still apples. <laughs> yeah. Apples do last really well through winter. Hey, all the snow that we got and this blizzard stuff, it got me doing some research on yeah. winter sport games. Did you know they had winter sports back then? Before we go on, though. Oh. Go ahead. They were hyping up this snowstorm like crazy. We thought we were, at first they said you're going to get four feet of snow. Oh yeah. Really which is unheard snow. of here. So the St. Louis area has really hot, humid, terrible summers. I mean weeks straight of just in the 90s and even hundreds. And then our winters are very bad because it's in the low 30s for months straight. So long summers, long winters in the St. Louis area. But we don't really go below zero degrees that often. Maybe it's pretty eight. rare. Yeah, so the thing is, they hyped up this snowstorm so much, they put a ton of salt on the road. We actually only got about an well, inch. Yeah. We got an inch. But it was negative five degrees, negative eight degrees, depending on the day. And we're, that's not in the middle of the night, that's in the morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 in the morning when you're out and about, negative 5 degrees. So it's crazy how cold it's been. One day the high was uh, 6 degrees. Wow. <laughs> but the, the they were right about the wind and the temperature, but wrong about the precipitation. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was, that was frigid cold. Yeah, it's the kind of cold where you go out and your nose gets sore right away. Yeah, it freezes. Mm -hmm. You can just crack it off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's done with his first plate. So today Ron's going to talk to you guys about snow sports that they had in our time period. That's right. Now what in the world are snow sports? Snow sports, <laughs> um, that's anything from snowballs, like throwing snowballs, it's mm -hmm. considered, considered sporting, it's fun, it's a game. Mm -hmm. The sport. Hmm. Uh, ice skating. They had ice skating back then. Very popular among the gentlemen. Oh. But also women did it too and so did kids. Hmm. And then sled riding, mm -hmm. which we all still love to do that today too. Sled riding is a lot of fun. Hmm. <clears throat> but it wasn't invented in our time. That's been around for a long time. But the interesting thing is when I was doing research on this stuff, hmm. a bit of modern talk, Google will tell you that 
the origin of ice skating is from the early 1900s, or the origin from sled riding is the late 1800s, and that's just wrong. Google is incredibly <laughs> it's wrong. It's so wrong, it, and that's the first thing that comes up. It's yeah, like, it's it does like wrong. that all the time. I'll have people that'll so tell me, oh, why are you making this dish? It wasn't invented until the 1870s. And then I, I'm like, oh, this person must read on Google. So I go to Google and I type in, when was pumpkin pie invented? Just for example, and it'll right. say 1870s. And I just want to face plant into a wall because it's the very first link. You're always lost by the first link. <laughs> it says the wrong date. It's not correct. It's just one link on the internet out of 10,000. Right. And it's not right. So. If you want to be a true historian, you never just Google things and then you see the very first sentence that pops up and you say, oh yeah, that's what it is, because it, how can it be true? We have paintings of the time period showing it, mm -hmm. quotes from people of the time period talking about it, cookbooks, cookbooks <laughs> from the time period saying, make a pumpkin pie, it's just a, that's just an example. And even older mm -hmm. from our time period, I, I've seen some French one from the 1600s. And so oh yeah, it's it, just an example. You, you have to be... Mm -hmm. A detective, you have to investigate. So I oh, investigated. Yeah. Um, I, I got a cheat sheet here because there's some dates on here. <clears throat> a Viking ship from the 9th century, the, uh, if I can pronounce this right, the Osberg ship. I think it's in a museum somewhere. It's a wow. pretty fascinating looking ship. Uh, they have found sleds on that ship. Archaeologists. Arch Archaeologists have found sleds on that ship. From the Vikings? Yes, from the 9th century. So sledding goes back to at least the 9th century. Probably a little before that, too. I mean, it's so simple. What do you use a sled for besides fun? For moving things in the wintertime. Because there's no there's no wheels. Wheels don't go well in the snow. So yeah. you slide on top of it. Makes sense to me. Right. Mm -hmm. I have here a first-hand account from the late 18th century from Albany, New York from uh, the Memoirs of an American Lady by Scotswoman Anne Mc... Mc... Uh, Mc Viker? Mc Viker. Hmm. Grant. Long name. Anyways, she writes here... Uh, where is that? Every boy and youth in town from 8 to 18 had a little low sledge. A sledge is another word for sled. Oh, so back then they called it a sledge? Yeah, it could be called hmm. sledge or sled or sleigh or skid or skids. Cool. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Let's see. I almost lost my spot here. Uh, she says, perhaps a hundred at once set out in succession from the top of the street, each seated in his little sledge, sled, with a rope in his hand which drawn to the right or to the left served to guide him. He pushed it off with a little stick as if one was launching a boat, and then with the most astonishing velocity, the little machine glided past and was at the lower end of the street in an instant. What could be so peculiarly delightful in this rapid and smooth descent, I never, I could never discover. <laughs> Though on a smaller scale, I have tried the amusement, but to a young Albalinian, yeah. Okay, a young Abilene New Yorker. Slaying, as he called it, was one of the first joys of life, though attended with the drawback of walking up to the top. Nobody likes to walk back to the top of the hill after you slay. Even down. in the 18th century, they didn't like yeah. it. Imagine it's... being a kid back then and getting together with all your friends in the village and just spending the whole day slaying down hilltops. <laughs> I've, I've done it before, but yeah, it's not fun when you got to walk back up. Yeah, and even back then they're complaining about it. <laughs> and it's even worse back then because your shoes back then ain't got treads on them like they do oh, today. Oh, yeah. Today we got, you know, snow boots with, you know, treads on yeah. them and stuff. But their sleighs or sledges had steering. Yeah. With a rope. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there was mechanical moving parts, but hmm. you can you can tilt, you can twist hmm. or bend uh, the, the wood. You know, you can put, put your pressure points. Right. Let, you know, lean with it and... But, uh, so anyways, uh, I got some notes here about ice skating. The uh, oldest pair of ice skates to be found by archaeologists was uh, dated to 3000 BC, and they were found at the bottom of the lake in Switzerland. Wow. 3000 BC. <laughs> so that tells you skating is nothing new, which no. is the complete opposite of what the internet will tell you. Well, it makes sense. You know, when the lake freezes over in wintertime, it almost becomes a bridge, yeah. and you can walk across it if you're brave enough. Now it's quite popular in our in our time period. At our time period, we had 
iron skates before our time period, they were made out of bone, like a, a femur bone or a, a oh. maybe an arm bone, but it says a big bone, particularly a leg bone, because they would they would scrape it and shape it, and uh, that just sounds crazy. That does. <laughs> your, your, your skate is a, a piece of bone, yeah. and it wouldn't dig in either. It was more of on top of the surface, so it would be really hard to... You know, you're, you know, when you're skating, how you're kind of really getting into it and you go to make a turn? If you did that without it digging in, you would probably just whoop. Mm. So I would imagine they weren't doing figure skating mm. a thousand years ago. They were just kind of, I'm yeah. going to shuffle over to the other side of this lake to save me three hours of hiking time. Yeah, he's talking about a really long time ago. <laughs> yeah. By our time period, they had metal skates. Right. And he, even in Queen Elizabeth the first time period, they loved ice skating and yeah. they had metal skates back yeah. then. That's when Shakespeare was around. By by the 14th century, it was iron skates and mm. they were, mm. they were um, uh, sharpened, if you will, or, or shaped to where they would cut into the ice so you can do twisty turns and... You know, oh, okay. go side to side without losing traction. Then it just becomes more fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's more of a sport now. And, and the, the really cool thing is a guy named Jackson Haynes, uh, he took the, uh, the the style of ballet. He was a trained ballet dancer, and he applied it to skating. That's where you get figure skating, where we do all the twisty flips and the, the hmm. fancy stuff, you know, where one leg's up in the air, and, wow. and you're out like this, and la. <laughs> huh. So that, that's pretty neat. That is really neat. But uh, they they would go out on the uh, ice in our time period with tents and stands and they would cook food and have drinks to serve for people and have um, recreational relaxation spots. It was like a whole, it was like a festival to be on the ice uh, in these cities. Like in New York when the Hudson would freeze over, they would bring their horses out on it with sleighs yeah. and stuff like that. And I actually have a first hand account here from uh, uh, New York up here. It says... Uh, in February of 1810, a man named Newell drove a sleigh and team of horses across Lake Champagne to Essex in New York to, trans to transact some business. When he failed to return home that night, his family was understand understandably alarmed. They searched the shoreline and presumably the lake ice, but found nothing. A month had passed and still no word oh. of the man. Then a young man in the town uh, dreamed he knew where to find Mr. Newell. So he led searchers to the spot on the ice that he thought would be the most logical, a short distance from the Vermont shore, and where they found part of a sleigh, and searching farther, fur further, they made a grisly discovery on the lake bottom. They found the rest of the sleigh, with the horses still attached, and Mr. Newell's body still grasping the reins. Wow, that got dark real quick. I, I thought you were going to tell me that he was out at a party for oh, no. a month or No, he was dead. Super dead. Oh, he was super dead. Super dead. Also, <laughs> a few years later, here's another account of falling through the ice. During the same period, a young man named William Hickok was skating with a friend on Lake Champlain, halfway between Burlington Harbor and Shelburne Point. The guide glided into a hole into the ice, and that's the last anyone saw of them, so they both died. Oh, that's horrible. Now, men in our time period, if they're out doing that, they, I guess they could wear shoes, but they probably had on some kind of boot. Uh, you can't swim in boots. They fill up with water. Oh, And it's true. freezing cold, so... It shocks you. It, I mean, haven't you ever seen the Titanic? They can't move. They're... <laughs> They're yeah. frozen in the water. Yeah, but when you in when your body goes into freezing cold water, your body goes into shock. Yeah. So you just kind of freeze up. And then on top of it, your brain tricks you because you want to stay still when you're really cold, but that's right. the worst thing you can do because if you move, you generate more heat. It might not be enough to save you, but you're still generating some heat. But that shock that hits you when you fall in freezing cold water can really confuse you. And so you just don't know what to do, and you freak out, and you can barely move. I'm full. You're full? It's really good. I'm not. <laughs> it's really good, but it's all meat and rice, so I'm full already. <laughs> and Ron is, you know, he should have just eaten straight off of that serving plate. I should have. Too late now. Wow. Now, random fact for you all, <laughs> I have a really bad phobia of drowning. It's like everybody kind does. Of well, here's the thing. I have it so bad, I don't even think mentally I could go to a beach, really. Hmm. When I was in middle school, when I was in the eighth grade, 
I lived in Korea at the time. I lived in Seoul, South Korea. Right. Because my dad was in the military. And so, with my Girl Scout troop, we went to the uh, seaside, which is really plentiful in South Korea. And it was the middle of winter time, but it sounds weird, but my Girl Scout troop said, let's go visit the fish market. So, as a troop, we were visiting this giant fish market over there. I don't know the town, unfortunately. But we all decided that we were going to go on the beach. And then my friends, they were just walking in the water up to like right below their knees. Even though it was freezing cold, it was like January. But they just were kids and were idiots. And so I, I, I go in a little bit deeper because as the tide is doing this motion, it kind of confuses you and you want to go with the tide. Mm -hmm. So after five or 10 minutes, you just find that you're a couple more feet further this way. Well, guess what happened? This huge rope of seaweed, this thing is like a hundred pounds. It wraps around my knees and it pulls me into the freezing cold water. Terrifying. I mean, it was, that water felt like it was five degrees. It was horrible. And so, and that, it was really slimy. I remember it was really slimy and really cold. And the, the water's doing this, the tide, the waves. So I, I'm like, should I go this way or should I go that way? I was really confused and disoriented. I didn't know what to do. And it took me maybe like 30 seconds to get my bearings straight, which might not sound like a long time, but when you're being death gripped by some seaweed in the middle of South Korea's ocean, yeah, it's a really, really long time. And so I finally figured out I had to go this way towards the shore and I was in the water like maybe up to here. Um, but my face was going under too occasionally, and it was just a terrifying experience for me. And when I went back to the beach, all my friends were laughing at me. They didn't realize what I'd just been through. And me being a kid, I didn't want to admit that that was really scary. So I just went about, about my day and I didn't really tell anybody until I was an adult. But ever since then, I've had a really bad phobia of drowning and watching people drown. So even seeing, like for example, my brother standing next to a lake really freaks me out. I'll, I'll say, come back, don't stand so close to the water. So I could never ever go ice skating on a real lake. I don't blame you. I would have, I mean, my heart would be beating out of my mouth because <laughs> I'd be afraid of falling down in there. So just imagine how terrible of a death that would be. But hey, we'll leave it to you guys' fate. If somebody wants to send me a size 12 ice skates, oh God. <laughs> I will do it if, if the pond freezes over. I will do my best to do my best Blades of Glory impression and do it. I won't do any triple twist, double back flips or anything, but I'll get out there dressed up and I'll put on a show for you guys. I'm a, it, please do not send ice skates, but if someone out there is really cruel and you do it, do it. I'm going to tie a rope to Ron's waist. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll have a safety rope. And don't yeah. worry, the pond's only six foot tall. <laughs> Help me! Help! <laughs> Help me! Help me! As long as the camera's rolling, who cares? Oh my god. Hey, we need to no. we, we do it for the views. No, no one's about to drown. <laughs> I can't even stand like people I love next to deep water. It freaks me out because I know if I don't they deep water. if they fall into that water, I know that I have to go into that water and save them. But you can't swim. I don't care. I would still do it. And it's because I've I have this mindset where it's gonna sound really, really morbid, but I would almost rather not be here than have to face my loved ones being dead. So I'd rather just go in there and do it and hope that we both make out alive. So I hate the idea of someone I love standing next to a lake and falling in. Well. Please don't send ice skates. <laughs> it's only six foot deep. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, well you might anyways, sink in the mud. I, I understand your reason. I would be terrified too. I, no. I have not had that situation and I already don't like dark, deep water. I won't get in it. I don't like it. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Because as soon as your feet leave the bottom, if you don't know how to swim. <laughs> I'm a good swimmer. I just, if I can't see the bottom, I don't like it. I don't know what's in there. Snapping yeah. turtles. Alligators. Sharks. Big river snakes. <laughs> Big ass river snakes. Big ass river snakes and Missouri river snakes. <laughs> hey, you want to tell them what you got for Christmas? Okay, I will. Yeah. 
And before anyone says, well, Justine, you're so scared of drowning because you can't swim. We're going to change that this coming summer. No. Swim. Want to throw her in the pool? No. I'm so scared. I'll give you floaties. I'm so scared of drowning that, that I can't learn how to swim. I just can't. Can't is not a word. You can. Say your prayer for me. Keep me in your thoughts, my dear viewers. Okay, let me now talk about what we got for Christmas. <laughs> okay, so the biggest thing that I got for Christmas isn't here, but a part of it is because Ron got me a sewing machine for Christmas. And I guess I was low-key dropping hints for months now that I wanted a <laughs> sewing machine. So he got me a Singer sewing machine. And Ron, you have your own sewing machine. Isn't it your uh, great-grandma's? Great, great. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, so when is that one from? It's a treadle Nin sewing machine. 1918. When I looked up mm -hmm. the, the uh, serial number on mm -hmm. it. It's a Singer treadle from 1918. Okay. And I know how to use it. And it works too. Yeah. We have a lot of our stuff that I've manipulated so that was too big. Because we, we buy some things used. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything, but some things we buy used. So I have to take them mm -hmm. in. Well, that's the way I do it. Because hand stitching just takes forever. And mm -hmm. to the purist, I'm not trying to be a purist... Uh, yeah. Taylor reenactor. That's not my per persona. So just hush. Yeah. <laughs> we ain't got time for hand stitching. Our everything. goal is just to teach as many people out there about history and our American culture. Yeah. It isn't about being a thread counter, you know, and just not being as fun. I mean, but I mean, if you want to do that, that's cool. But we're just too busy for all. I hate hand sewing. Yeah. So anyway, Ron got me a sewing machine, and this one is an electric sewing machine. So, do you see my new apron? It's electric. <laughs> I used to know how to do that line dance. I made this apron the day after Christmas, so I want to try out that sewing machine so bad that I made no, this apron. No, you made it on Christmas Day, Christmas morning. Oh, that's right! Yeah, because I was really impatient, and I asked Ron if I could open up the present Christmas Eve night. Yeah. But anyway, so Christmas Christmas morning, I was so excited that I immediately w uh, made an apron. And Ron, Ron helped me because he taught me how to use a sewing machine. We have a video that I did with Candy showing myself uh, using a sewing machine for the very first time, which was only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I had never used a sewing machine before. I felt like a Victorian who has experienced sewing machines for the first time. It was incredible. It changed my whole world. Cause I'm so used to hand sewing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, she did the pleats. Yep. And this is all pleated, and it turned out really nice. Yeah, with Ron's <laughs> help teaching me how to thread it, the I, sewing machine and everything. I just guided you. Thank That's you. All. Thank you. You did all the hard work. Yep. So now I'm probably going to be wearing a new apron every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of an apron hoarder. Well, Aprons are my thing. What else did you get for Christmas? Okay, so what else did I get for Christmas? <laughs> I got this box. This is a handmade box, handmade in Illinois. And these are from Candy Store. Yeah, these are from Candy Store. It came with a little uh, paper pamphlet in here. So it turns out that this style of box is actually Viking, but it's just really cool. And it's steamed wood. This is walnut. Mm -hmm. They've steamed it and bent it, and uh, they nail it to the bottom in there. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> This box is called a Tina. It's a Norwegian and Swedish bent wood box with snap-on lids. They date back to the Viking period from 700 to 800 AD is the first that they were discovered. Hmm. And they were made by uh, someone named Marion Mitchell. Marion. Marion from Carbondale, Illinois. Hmm. And they're for sale in candy store, but I never bought one because I couldn't afford it. And then someone gave it to me for Christmas. So thank you. And I'm using it as a sewing box. And Ron got me all these new sewing goodies in here. So he gave me new scissors. This is a, the whole set is from Singer, which is the brand that my sewing machine's from. Mm -hmm. And I finally have a pin cushion. I've never had a pin cushion before. Usually whenever I would sew, I would put my needles in the armchair. You know the, the funny arm thing the is, this is the pincushion I had from uh, seventh grade home ec in middle Seriously? school back in 2005, 2004. 
I still got it. Wow, well, that's How long awesome. you got it? I'll give it a good home. Thanks. <laughs> I got a seam ripper. I've never had a seam ripper before. Those are handy dandy. Yeah, I just, I have, it came with all these absolutely amazing, incredible goodies. One of every color kind of thread. Oh yeah, he gave me all this thread. You got big ones too, but they're yep. with your machine. I have big ones too, but uh, they're with my sewing machine. And so check out this box. It just snaps on, like so. And she's got bigger ones and smaller ones for sale too. Now they're not mm -hmm. on the internet, you'll have to call in person. Yeah, or go on her Facebook. <sighs> or, yeah. Sassafras Creek Originals. She's got them in walnut and cherry, and mm -hmm. there might be some oak or maple, but I know for sure walnut and cherry, if anybody's interested mm -hmm. in that. So this is my new sewing box, yep. and I have a new sewing machine, and a new apron. You got clothes too, didn't you? Um, I got a green bodice. Oh, yeah. You gave me, Ron gave me an 18th century green bodice mm -hmm. from Samson Historical. It's wool, um, but I'm going to show it to you guys uh not now i want to be surprised <laughs> now this is what candy gave me for christmas she gave me a really nice mixing bowl yeah that's a that's a nice one i like the shape of that one. Oh, this this is incredible and we've used it already i've actually made salads in this it's really good for just mixing up salads or whatever but it's funny because i saw this for sale in candy's store uh, like a month ago and then a week later it wasn't there anymore and i was kind of disappointed because i wanted to buy it <laughs> <laughs> and she asked me she's like oh i guess candy sold that bowl and i was like oh uh yeah she sold it about because you ago. were in on it yeah because i knew she was getting it <laughs> yeah and, and then i opened the box and whoa this bowl is here so it all worked out in the end didn't it and i really love this bowl it's very period correct there were a lot of brown wear uh <laughs> serving bowls and plates back then and that one's from old Sturbridge village you're right is there yeah, a date it's, on it uh no but it says on the back old Sturbridge village they make their own pottery up there or at least mm -hmm. they used to we're not sure how old that bowl is yeah i really want to go there someday i've never been there just because we've never really been to that area but someday yeah someday. i'd like to go i got a new pair of pants which you guys uh will see someday they're gray Yes. Uh, They're made out of early 1800s denim, yep. which they did have denim back then. Mm -hmm. yep. It just looked different. <laughs> I got that. I got some uh, really good coffee. I got a brand new lantern, which you guys will see one day. It's not here at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I got some uh, cool historical t-shirts. I'm a t-shirt guy, okay? <laughs> but I, I love historical t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And so Justine got me a few of them, and she's got me some uh, reprint pamphlets that come out during the American Revolution. So those are really neat. Yep, one of them is the uh, Declaration of Independence, yep. as it originally a was. A reprint of that, yep. Yeah, as it originally was in this little bound paperback book. So we had a very good Christmas, and I hope you yeah. guys did too. Yeah, I ate, uh, I ate modestly for Christmas. I didn't overdo it. Oh. I overdid it before Christmas with the cookies we had last week. I gained like eight pounds from all them shortbread cookies. Because yeah. Because after the show, guess who ate them all? It's the season for gaining weight. Uh, I ate a lot of them. <laughs> I ate a lot. We did half and half. I don't know what you mean. I don't, we well, both I mean, ate them. I hit the eggnog kind of hard too. Yeah, so that's the thing. I don't drink that, so I guess that, that is the area that needs working on. <laughs> but the, if I could recommend anything recently that we've done, definitely make the shortbread cookies. It doesn't have to be Christmas time. Even if you don't have the stamp, this cut them out make drop cookies and, and smash them flat so you just have circle cookies or, yeah. or cut them out and then definitely make this 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 is, is a really home run. yeah this was really good as you can see there's nothing left and if i had a piece of bread i would have sopped all this up because this yeah. is this is good well you know what i told ron earlier i said that pulled pork that we used for this i'm going to make it again someday off camera in the same curry sauce, the exact same way that I made it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to serve it on a plate with a side of mashed potatoes and maybe some green beans be or good. corn or what have you for a very more modern meal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that this is a keeper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is very, very good. Yeah. Just change it around a little bit if you want it to look more modern or to be easier on us with you. But we had to try it how they did it 200 years ago. That's and right. thank you guys for watching us. Yes. We really, really appreciate it. So. We hope you have a happy new year. Yes. You will see us, I think it's a day or two after New Year's. 
Hmm. But uh, we have, will be a wassailin. Yeah, we'll be a wassailin, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay, we'll <laughs> see you then. Take care, everybody. Until later. Bye Take bye. care. Bye bye.